A gun life, a self-defense life is the foundation for the American dream because without self-defense, you ain't got nothing. Hey folks, it's Kevin Michalowski again here, editor of Concealed Carry Magazine and director of content for the United States Concealed Carry Association. And I have a very special guest this time, somebody who needs no inter interruption. Somebody needs no introduction. I just know he's going to interrupt me sooner or later. He's got a lot to say. This is a man who defends truth, justice, and the American way. The Motor City Madman himself, Ted Nugent. Ted, thanks for being here. My pleasure, Kevin. God bless you. God bless America. And God bless the people who uh, cherish and perform their spiritual, intellectual, and American patriotic duties of self-defense. I'm so proud to share this campfire with you. Ted, I just want to start in by telling a story to all the folks here before we get going on this whole interview thing that, that you changed my life back in 1995. So wow. we were together. We were together in 95, the first time we ever met at the Governor's Symposium for North American Hunting Heritage in beautiful Green Bay, Wisconsin. Ah, and, yeah. Uh, and and uh, you were the keynote speaker. And afterwards, you put your hand on my shoulder and you said, Kevin, well, you knew my name because I was wearing a name tag. And you said, Kevin, you need to be bold. You need to rise above the noise in this industry and you will get nowhere unless you be bold. And that was 1995. I quit my job in the liberal daily newspaper business. And by 1997, I was working at Gun Digest magazine. And I decided that guns were the things for me because Ted Nugent told me to be bold. So I am here talking to you because of you. And thank you very much. I think about that all the time when I'm doing crazy stuff on camera. So thank you very, very much. I, I, I can't thank you enough for just those words of, of support. Well, you know, Kevin, uh, I'm, I'm moved by those words and that scenario that you uh, just laid out for us. But you know, that was not that long ago. I, I imagine in your young life, it was a long time ago, but I'm going to be 72 years old here in a few days. And that encounter that you experienced with me is my modus operandi since I was about 18 years old because I, I landed head first into the uh, hippie, well, actually it was the beatnik world of uh, music and rock and roll. And all these clowns were trying to, uh, you know, get me to go the Mao Tse Tung route and smoke dope and, and fade out and become uncomfortably dumb. I think they called it comfortably numb, but it was actually uncomfortably dumb. So I realized as a hunter, especially with a bow and arrow, you really got to be tuned into your surroundings. Before I knew the term situational awareness, my dad taught me situational awareness. And so I think that's the message I conveyed to you. And Kevin, I'm glad that we had that encounter. I'm more glad than you are, because if we really examine my vapor trail in my American dream for the last at least 65 years, I've been a hell raiser, a truth, logic, common sense crowbar you know, perpetrator all my life because I saw the status quo was just infested with imbeciles and their policies and their dreams and their fantasies were the foundation of every societal ruination in the history of mankind. So a gun life, a self-defense life is the foundation for the American dream because without self-defense, you ain't got nothing. So I, we are blood brothers for that truth, logic, and common sense. Kevin, thank you for that. Absolutely. Hey, is there one element, is there one thing that created Ted Nugent, the activist? Is there, is there one pivotal moment, you know, where, where you thought, you know what, Th these people are crazy and I have to speak up. What is it that pushed you forward to do this? You know, it, it happens all the time. It's kind of faded away in the last few years because I scare the hell out of the liberals and they don't dare try to debate me because they watch the Pierce Morgan interview or any of my so-called debates and they watch me just eat their family tree and spit toxic sawdust in their face because I got truth, logic, common sense, every shard of historical evidence to support everything I believe in because I may come off cocky, which is what the founding fathers wanted all of us to be, but my cockiness is eclipsed by my humbleness that I genuflect at the altar of history, evidence, truth, logic, common sense. And I've been forced to absorb that in my earliest years by a very disciplinary, loving mom and dad. Thank God, huh? So I could name thousands of examples where I was, and not just 
uh, uh, countered or, 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 uh, or questioned or, or uh, uh, belittled. I was viciously attacked because I ate venison and I carried a gun. Two of the most perfect things a human being can do, by the way, and I knew it even as a kid in the teenage rock and roll world, when the music industry, the Hollywood dirtbags, would attack me for celebrating that my energy and my piss and vinegar and my aliveness came from a weekend bow hunting with my dad. And they go, well, you don't kill animals, do you? And I go, no, I eat them alive. What kind of question is that? Are you, are you kidding me? You never heard of cordon bleu or sushi, a dirt bag? So I, being a Detroit cocky guy, I was able to immediately respond with uh, more outrage than they uh, perceived their attack to be. And then in, over the years, it continued to escalate where I go, of, co of course I carry a gun. I, I carry a gun and a clean handkerchief and a pocket knife and I got a little flashlight and I got some guitar picks and I got my wallet with some ID and a few bucks in it and a driver's license. I, stop me when I confuse you. So yeah, I, I, was you raised, <laughs> yeah, and I was raised to be self-sufficient and a Boy Scout to always be prepared. And when I was a, when I was just viciously, just bombarded with hate because I carried a gun, and and they they didn't just discover it happenstance. A lot of times I'd talk about where my guitar maneuvers come from, not just Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley, but uh, Colonel Cooper and uh, <laughs> and uh, aim small, miss small snipers that I got to train with as a kid. And that higher level of physics of spirituality of the marksmanship discipline and the mystical flight of the arrow discipline that goes right to any and all endeavors in life especially guitar playing and musical communication with these incredible virtuosos that i've been surrounded with all my life so as they attacked me i i went why well, I, I see the guns of autumn by dan rather on cbs where they manipulated nasty footage in slow motion and lies about hunting. Hunting is perfect. Conservation is perfect. It's perfect responsibility of balancing the herd every year during Thanksgiving period to make room for next year's wildlife production. Even guitar players can figure that stuff out. So as they would attack me for the guns and hunting and because I'm anti-dope, I don't think comfortably numb benefits anybody. I don't want my babysitter comfortably numb. I don't want my kid's school bus driver comfortably numb. I don't want my bass player comfortably numb. I don't, I don't want anybody in my life comfortably numb, except comedians. I hope they're stoned and drunk as long as they call for a, a, a driver to get them home. I love my comedians to be completely brain dead because they're more funny that way. My point being is that I saw the attacks on what I knew was a perfect intellectual responsibility of self self-sufficiency self-defense and again the the joys of marksmanship the joys of shooting the discipline of hand-eye coordination breathing sight acquisition trigger uh, memory you know control all this stuff goes to making you a better welder a better parent a better bandmate a better, a better everything. So those shooting sports disciplines were so powerfully positive in my life that when I was attacked for them, typically, Kevin, by drooling idiots, hi. And I, I go, not only is my shooting sports cool, but you're drooling and there's boogers coming out of your nose because you're comfortably numb, you numb nut. So I, I responded uh, as I knew I should to stand up, never defending, always celebrating and promoting these self-evident truths. Mm -hmm. You said, we'll turn this back to the things that I do now, you know, they, they concealed carry, they carrying a gun. I don't know if you know this, I see you got the blue line flag in the back, I'm also a police mm -hmm. officer. So um, you said you carry a gun. Everyone's asking, and, and we put out a bunch of notes and, and people have asked us questions. What do you carry every day, Ted? What's your everyday carry rig? What's your favorite self-defense pistol? Well, I've always carried, uh, since I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school. I started well off with a, a Smith West two inch model 19 with a pocket full of speed loaders and uh, some plus P stuff and some wad cutters for the occasional rabbit or squirrel that I had to dispatch. And I've always, sh I shoot a lot. I mean, if I'm driving down the road in the country and I see a woodchuck, 
I'm going to pull over and I'm going to put on a stock. I promise you that. And that's where the 38 wad cutters came in handy. And then I went to a four inch model 19. And then I went to a 1911 45 ACP. Um, and I've carried a little bit of everything. I carried a Beretta 92 for a long time. I carried a Smith and Wesson model 29, uh, six and a half inch blue and <laughs> in my belt for about 12 years with a pocket full of speed loaders. Boy, no wonder I have to have hearing aids. I, I, I don't know if it was the guitar or this 44 Magnum, but either way, um, I started wearing hearing protection later on. But over 25 years now, I forget the actual year that Glock came out with the 10 millimeter Model 20. Mm -hmm. um, I found that not only what Jeff Cooper's uh, creation for the FBI, who turned it down because they're such wimps, and some of them are just criminal wimps, by the way, James Comey, um, that they turned down the 10 millimeter because it hurt their wrists. <laughs> it didn't surprise me. Um, and it, it, I find that the 10 millimeter in the Glock with high capacity is a super hunting firearm if you practice and you learn to become samurai Bruce Lee with a pistol. Um, and it's also proven to be the best one-shot stop by uh, 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 Peter Pye and Kirk, uh, 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 the ex-homicide uh, detective, Evan Marshall, out of Detroit. Um, it's been a very effective round. Of course, we all know the Smith & Wesson, the 40 Smith & Wesson is the uh, reduced 10 millimeters, like a 10 short. But I'm a big 10 millimeter fan. I carry a 10 millimeter Glock and a belt full of magazines everywhere I go. And I shoot almost every day, at least five, six days a week in various scenarios, backing up my hog hunters. I, I hunt big game with my Glock 10 millimeter. And I train on a steel plate range uh, every few days. So I, I really enjoy the caliber. It really does the job on big game and it's been proven to do the job on bad game too. Yeah, I've seen a video of you uh, dispatching a Cape Buffalo with a Glock 10 millimeter. It was on a bow hunt episode, and uh, and you, you hit the Cape Buffalo a little bit far back, and you had to go looking for him, do the responsible yeah. thing. And uh, and uh, that Glock 10 millimeter put some uh, put some rounds down range and uh, stopped the Cape Buffalo. And I was thinking, okay, so yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, it really I know did. I was, uh, carrying, I was carrying uh, Peter Pye's 100. One, I think it was a 180 grain penetrator at the time, just for that purpose as my backup. Of course, the, the pH is the professional hunters in Africa scoffed at the guitar player that thought he could kill a Cape Buffalo with a 10 millimeter. But again, I aim for the, I aim for the neck and I, I literally cut the vertebrae in half and dropped him in his tracks. Yeah. And my yeah. buddy, uh, Razor Dobbs with various 10 millimeters has killed Cape Buffalo as many, not many, but a number of hunters have handgun hunters uh, with well-placed proper bullet design uh, right in the vitals like you would a, a 460 Weatherby. Maybe it's not as quick as a 460 Weatherby, yeah. but the Cape Buffalo died uh, post-haste. I want to do just a little bit of business here, folks. Um, we've got a special URL out there, uscca.com backslash Nugent, uscca.com backslash Nugent. Ted has worked with us on putting together a beautiful download of the seven things you need to know about justified use of deadly force. We want to make sure that people are following the law, that, you know, um, that's what we do here at the USCCA, situational awareness, conflict avoidance, and keeping people out of jail. So um, we put together a, a great little uh, piece. Um, all you got to do is give us an email. We'll send it right to you. It's one page long, seven great tips that uh, justified the d use of deadly force. So we're talking about following the law, doing the right thing. This is what we do here at the USCCA. We got a question that came in over the transom. Somebody asked, now, parenting advice from Ted Nugent, right here, here we go. What would you tell parents raising a child in America today? How do we preserve and improve this country for the future? You know, Kevin, I, I'm, I'm honored that anybody would uh, pursue a parental advice, parenting advice from the Motor City Madman. But even though it seems to be um, a, a slight uh, a, a, a opposite, I promise you, if you met my sons and daughters, if you met my grandsons, and if the world operated like the Nugent family operated, it would be a beautiful, crime-free, welfare-free, healthy, giving, loving, generous, cocky, fun, a positive world because my kids, my grandkids, the way we've raised them is a is a confluence of hardcore snuggling, mushy love and hardcore demanding discipline about being the best that you can be, about um, always putting your heart and soul into being in the asset column at the end of the day. 
Was your conduct, your activities, and your productivity and work ethic, did it translate into putting you into the asset column of your family? Does your life and your energy benefit your family? Does it benefit your neighbors? Does it benefit the earth? Does it benefit the wildlife? Does it benefit your country? And the Nugent family, my brother Jeff, my sister Kathy, my, my, my poor brother John who passed earlier this year, and all their families, Kevin, uh, the best way to put it is they are in the asset column because we were raised that you had to be in the asset column. If you met my, well, you had a little exchange with my son, Toby, prior to this uh, exchange we're having now, but talking about great human beings, loving, caring, funny, cocky, defiant, all in the right moments, but they, they so put their heart and soul into everything that they do. And let me, let me go back to the origin now. And it's not a coincidence that I'm on here, Kevin, at the United States Concealed Carry Association, because I've always been a gun guy, first and foremost, because it's fun. As a kid, you didn't think self-defense. As a kid, you didn't really think about killing a deer, because we started when we were four or five, six years old with Daisy Red Riders, and then eventually 22 revolvers with CB caps, so there was no report and there's no recoil. There's a proper way to do that. But I hope everybody is actually taking notes, because as you introduce your children to tools, and let me take a little left turn here for a moment. I think if we went around to the schools in America today, Kevin, with a hammer, 75% of the kids wouldn't know which end to hold on to. So, so it's not just firearms tools. A kid should learn how to wash dishes and sweep the floor and vacuum. They should learn how to make the bed and to take out the trash. They should learn how to shovel the dog kennels and brush the dogs. This this system of individual responsibility, boy, there's the battle cry, individual accountability must be imprinted very, very early, two, three, four years old. And my grandkids are on the way here to the swamps of Michigan right now. And I think Rowan is just four. Finnegan, I think, is eight or nine now. And and Caden is, he's got to be 12 and my my grandson jack is 18 state golf champ by the way he's not into the guns so much though he's really a good marksman but that golf discipline is not unlike marksmanship hand eye spirit coordination focus laser beam tractor beam to the given dimple on the ball like the crosshair settling on the on the uh, the the minutest center of the x so parenting can be ultimately accomplished via all the things I just mentioned, chore responsibility, polite, responsible conduct, but ultimately applied on the shooting bench at the gun range at an early age, because there's, there's only one gun law needed for mankind. Only one gun law needed for mankind. I emphasize that. And that is never point the muzzle at anything you're not willing to destroy. That's the only gun law we need on planet Earth. And once you imprint that in the children, and if they look like they're going to sway and violate that primary gun rule, then you immediately parent them and discipline and let them know and shoot a, a can of tomato juice with a high velocity bullet and let them know that that could happen to your head. That could happen to your friend if the muzzle's pointed towards something you're not willing to destroy. So these are the basics. And again, I'm just a guitar player, but I was raised like that in that uh, incremental uh, uh, parental discipline uh, uh, accountability. And that's how my kids are. And by the way, my band, my crew, everybody in my life, my hunting guides, my buddies, they all subscribed. This isn't a Ted Nugent hunch. I don't, I don't really have an opinion on this. This works. And I'll tell you right now, not one of these rioting punks in Seattle or Portland or in Minneapolis, none of these anarchists or these arsonists or these murdering savage criminals, none of them were disciplined in the shooting sports. 
I can assure you, none of them had a hunting license in their pocket as they burnt down the city. So there's a disciplined God, family, country, law and order lifestyle that you and I, and I think everybody at USCCA represents. I'm proud. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. When we're talking about individual personal responsibility, that's one of the things we really preach here at USCCA is that, you know, we're the good guys. If we're involved in a deadly force incident and we have to shoot a bad guy, God forbid, we stand around and wait for the police to come. That's why we want to make sure that people are doing it right. They have the laws memorized. They know what they need to do before they get out there. And, and honestly, folks, you can get that information uscca.com slash Nugent. Go right there, download that. The seven rules for justifying the use of deadly force. We've got that right out there. So we want to make sure that, that everybody's doing the right thing because, you know, we're the good guys and we can prove it by knowing the laws, following the laws and, and doing what we're supposed to do. So um, we, we got another uh, question that came in from one of our viewers and, and this one is actually kind of makes me smile just a little bit. It's a uh, Ted, how much ammo do you have and how much ammo should the average red-blooded American keep and store at home? <laughs> well, to the first question, none of your damn business. Um, you to go. the second question, <laughs> I, I, Kevin, I wish I could turn this camera around. You know, you've heard that guys like to have a man cave. You've heard about yep. man caves. Yeah. Well, mine actually qualifies as a man's cuckoo's nest. Oh, I have so go. many bows and arrows. I have so many guns. I have so much ammo that it borders law. It it borderline spooky to the average civilian. Um, but I shoot a lot. I go through a lot of ammo. When my grandkids and my daughter Sasha, the whole they're all getting together. My band's coming for the opening day of the Michigan firearm season, and <laughs> it's going to be a shoot fest. And by the way. When you have full auto stuff, you better have a lot of ammo because the brass rainbows tend to accumulate a whole lot of bullet use. Uh, I would say in this day and age, even uh, before there was this societal upheaval and the Marxists uh, uh, taking over the Democrat Party and the threats being just treacherous and heartbreaking like they are today, this is a whole new brave world right now. Before any of that happened, I always had thousands of each caliber. And I could go right down the list from 22s to 38s to 357s to 9 millimeters and some 38 special, I mean, 38 super stuff, uh, 44 specials, 44 Magnum, 45 70s. I got two, four, a lot of 223. I got a couple of hundred thousand rounds of a 223. And, uh, um, I got a lot of 308 and, and got a lot of uh, 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 7 mag, I got a lot of 270, some 280, 300 winter short, short mag. I got a bunch of 460 Weatherby stuff. Uh, so I have a lot of ammo. I would say that because we see the Democrats, I, I, I'm sorry, the Marxists literally telling the sheepdogs to back off the wolves and allow the sheep to become victims. Now that that uh, demonic policy exists, I, it, it, it just doesn't get more horrible than people with s presumed authority telling the, the professionals of law enforcement to not do their job and let the city burn, let people get bricked and two by four and stabbed and shot without intervening. Now that we know such an atrocity is happening, I would recommend that everybody have at least thousands of preferred, thousands of rounds in their preferred caliber. Of course, the big deal is 45 ACP, nine millimeter, 762 stuff, um, a, a lot of 556. Five, but I would venture to say a lot of my friends have them in the tens of thousands, and I have friends that have them in the hundreds of thousands. Um, I think it's like, the what I consider the battle cry of independence is nobody's ever said I have too much ammo. Yeah, so absolutely. I, I think uh, a responsible individual would have plenty to hold down the fort. We just did an interview with the great Mark Geis, who was on the rooftop in Benghazi. And uh, I get to train with these heroes of the U.S. Marine Corps, which, by the way, happy Veterans Day every day. Happy Marine Corps birthday 
every day. Happy Independence Day every day. Happy Thanksgiving every day. But I get to hang and train with these guys, the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, the Army Rangers, uh, SWAT teams from around the country. Uh, I'm just the luckiest guitar player shooter in the world because I get to hang with the, 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 the best of the best. And these guys, um, whether they're current law enforcement, by the way, you mentioned, uh, Kevin, that you're law enforcement. I've been a sheriff deputy in Lake County, Michigan since 1984, and I keep those credentials current, and I have to qualify every year. And I've actually conducted raids with the U.S. Marshal Heroes uh, in Texas, arresting numerous felons, wondering why we had to go after them and finding out who let them out is who we should be arresting. Uh, being that as it may, I think self-defense and the proper tools, the proper knowledge, understanding, and proficiency with those tools and the ammunition to go with those tools is uh, one of the most important responsibilities of any leader of any household in America today. Ted, we, uh, we just heard the long list. So now if we, uh, if we had to demand, Ted, you get one gun that you're going to shoot for the rest of your life. It's going to make you the happiest. What is Ted Nugent's favorite gun? Well, for the record, I can't choose my favorite kid, my favorite dog, my favorite guitar, and I sure as hell can't choose my favorite gun. So now that I've made that perfectly clear, uh, because I do like to rotate them, I like to shoot so many, but if, if that unacceptable demand ever took place, I have the most beautiful M4 um, that I, if I had to have one gun, it would be my M16, my M4. Yeah, absolutely. Those are just great fun to shoot, and and they're so versatile. I'm I'm very happy. I I own well, never mind. It's none of your business. I I've I've shot one of those before, um, so I really enjoy that. So, um, I am reminded of a story you told about a long-haired rock and roller going into a sports shop and being kind of mistreated. So I want to bring this back around to that question. How do you recommend that new shooters get started and get involved in this? what I will call the concealed carry or self-defense or freedom-loving lifestyle. Uh, I remember you telling that story about you, you walking into a sports shop and, and the, the old guys behind the counter wanted nothing to do with you with your long hair and your, your crazy attitude. So, so how do we bring people together and get us all involved in this? Well, that, that's a great question, Kevin. And I think the conditions in this day and age and the, as we're wrapping up the year 2020 is horrible horrific as the year 2020 has been, I think there was a, a, a tragic era in the shooting sports and in the firearms industry where people like myself with a certain look, I looked like a hippie, but I was, I was the definitive <laughs> anti-hippie that ever lived. I was like the other ultimate undercover hippie. <laughs> I busted more hippies than the, than the narcs. Uh, my, uh, my point in the USD uh, Drug Administration, uh, there was a time where women and rock and roll looking people were shunned in the gun stores of this country. I, I experienced that a lot in the late sixties and the seventies. And I loved guns and I loved gun people and I knew guns and I carried a gun and I shot guns. And I was fascinated by the, the firearms tools of the world. And I would be uh, ostracized and made fun of in the gun shop and then much worse than that, Kevin, in my radio time, I had my own radio show here in Michigan for a number of years, and I do radio all the time. We're always uh, having wonderful Q&A sessions in these radio shows I do. And I have my own spirit campfire on uh, a Zoom call with the great John Brankus every Monday and Thursday. So I communicate with lots of people. And I would always tell women that you're not independent. If you believe in woman's power, you got to be armed. Because if you're unarmed and helpless, the baddest of the bad guys, they're looking for you and they will find you. And if you're unarmed and helpless, there's not a damn thing you can do to stop the bad guys. So what you need to be is truly independent and you need to go down to your local gun store and have someone experienced and professional give you some advice on what gun to shoot, what ammo to load it with, how to handle that gun, maybe uh, guide you on a range and, and baptize you into the the discipline of the shooting sports. Kevin, the number of horror stories that my wife, Shemaine, and I heard from women that would go from gun store to gun store and just be made fun of 
or they'd hand them a big old 10 gauge double barrel or the whole the old uh, history of yeah i taught my little girl how to shoot gave her a 10 gauge and blew her on her ass <laughs> well you just created an anti-gunner you dirt bag i mean you gotta be conscientious and i have found thank god i think most of those stupid people in the industry are either gone or behind a desk somewhere where they don't have to interact with other people. I think nowadays is the best time to be baptized into the shooting sports discipline and enjoyment because I think the people behind the counter for the most part in gun stores across America really know their responsibility to gently and intelligently and compassionately welcome new shooters. And right now, as you and I are doing this, Kevin, the facts are irrefutable. There are more new gun purchasers in America today in 2020 than I think in any year in recorded history. Let's say hallelujah. And I am confident that for the most part, they're probably getting darn good instruction. And my basic instruction has always been to let somebody fondle that gun, make them open the cylinder, make them spin the cylinder, make them close the cylinder, make them dry fire that gun is safe, pointing in a safe direction. Most gun counters won't let you do that, but the better ones will. And I think that we have grown up and become more sophisticated and intelligent that that new shooter is the most important gun owner in America. And I think we're in good hands these days. Thank God, and I salute everybody. But here's a, to my friends in USCCA. If you experience or you hear of an experience where someone is mistreated at a gun store, go to that gun store, very gentlemanly-like, very ladylike, find the person who was being a smart ass to that new gun purchaser, and try to have a little talk with them and let them know that those of us that our concealed carriers, those of us that are Second Amendment believers and demanders. You can't just believe in the Second Amendment. You have to demand the Second Amendment. You need to put your arm around that guy. You know, friend, you're at a gun store. You represent me. And when somebody comes in to buy their first gun, you need to be the most loving, caring, attentive, introductory person to that new shooter. And I always say they should start with a revolver, something very mechanical where you load the cylinder, you close the cylinder, you lock the cylinder, you double action, single action, and you know the mechanics because your first shooters typically are gonna be limp wristed and you wanna get them a 32 or a 380. And those are the first ones that are gonna jam because of the, list, the, the limp wrist syndrome of a new shooter, whereas a revolver will not jam. So there's a lot of little tricks and I'm not the master, Wait a minute, I actually am the master of that because I've introduced more, <laughs> more young people uh, to the shooting sports than maybe anybody that ever lived. That, I'm not bragging, but I've had a Ted Nugent Camp for Kids charity for 31 years, and we've baptized tens of thousands of young people into the joys and the fun and the responsibility of the shooting sports. So I really do have a lot of experience in that world because the people in the rock and roll world who are brainwashed with anti-gun nonsense all their lives from the media, all of a sudden they hear me doing an interview talking about the joys and the, sa the safety and the responsibility. And they go, well, that doesn't sound like I, what I heard from NBC. Uh, Uncle Ted said I should get a gun. I'm going to go buy a gun. So I, I hear from people like that all the time. And I'm very, very proud of that influence because when I talk, as you can tell, I'm believable. I, I, I have the nomenclature. I know the functionality. Um, I have a great history of the shooting sports. And it's contagious when presented in an honest, accurate, enthusiastic manner. So I think these are the good old days for getting new gun owners to join the NRA, join the Gun Owners of America, join their state firearms association, and certainly, most important of all, become a member of USCCA. This is the most important organization, I believe, Kevin, in the in the shooting world right now, in the self-defense world. Well, thank you very much for saying so. And, you know, that's another great segue that just lets us remind folks, you know, uscca.com slash Nugent, and that's just a starting point. You know, the seven things you need to know for the justified use of deadly force, that's what we're giving you right there. And 
We offer so much free information and training at the USCCA just to get people started. I want everybody in America carrying a gun. You know, people have told me 100 million gun owners in America. Yeah, I want all the rest. There, there's you know, 400 million yeah. people in the country. Um, I want yeah. them all carrying a gun. And right back to your point of individual personal responsibility, those are the sorts of things that we want to talk about all the time. So as, as we get close to wrapping this up here, I want to talk a little bit about training and what's your belief on the importance of training and understanding the legal system uh, when, when folks who are, are carrying a gun for self-defense and some, you know, we carry one because we think that someday we might have to use it, God forbid, and, and I say that all the time, that we might have to use it. But w when you're thinking about what kind of training people should do and how often they should train, what do you suggest for folks? Well, let, let me do uh, start at the most extreme because I, I hear all the time, well, you should carry a gun, but only if you have the proper training and the proper introduction. Well, that's desirable and it's better than not having the training and not having the proper introduction. But there are documented cases, Kevin. Humans are really smart people, most of them. <laughs> Um, they improvise, adapt, and they can overcome under most conditions. I mean, our founding fathers and our, the pioneers and the people who uh, westward ho across America, my God, the hardships they put up with, um, they were survivalists. They were uh, improvisers, adapters, and they overcame. And there are many instances documented where a little old lady at a bakery in New York City was at, robbed by the same damn guys over and over again, and she was scared to death. She wanted to buy a gun, but she couldn't buy a gun in Manhattan. And she couldn't get a permit to carry a gun, so she got a hold of Uncle Joe. This is a rough outline of, of one of the scenarios that I know has been documented. And she got a little 38 revolver, and she put it under the counter, and she didn't like to touch it. She was afraid of it. I don't like the gun, but I'm scared the robbers come in. Well, she ended up using the gun. She knew where the first time she ever shot it, she defended her life. Mm -hmm. Zero training, zero experience, but she knew where to grab it. She knew where the trigger was, and she knew which end the, bear, the bullet came out of, and she saved her life. Obviously, in New York, she was prosecuted to the hilt until eventually the charges were dropped because it was, it was an undeniable, clear-cut case of self-defense, kind of like Kyle Rittenhouse and uh, numerous other clean shootings that have happened across this country where the good guy is prosecuted more than the bad guys. That being said, whether you're going to play guitar or weld or paint fences <laughs> or, 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 or shoot a gun, Experience is highly beneficial. Training in all scenarios, in all endeavors, is always going to be beneficial. And nowadays, because there's so many new shooters coming in and there's so much intelligence and capabilities in the gun stores of America, I think the, the battle cry universally across America right now is, yes, here's the gun you want to get. Does it feel good for you if you'd like to purchase it? Can you come to the range Saturday? I have a guy, here's his card, he can train you. I think this is approaching universality at this point, thank God. Mm -hmm. And the more you shoot, I, I like to think in terms with my guitar, my bow and arrow, uh, my my torches. <laughs> I like to, I can't, I can't believe I can still play guitar. I've always got band-aids on my fingers. I'm, I'm always hammering and slicing my hands. I can't believe I have any fingers left. Maybe I should train more with the hammer and the hatchet. Uh, the point is, experience can turn you into a samurai. And archery, if you're a, if you're a shooter, if you like firearms, especially handguns, get a bow and arrow. Because when you come back to full draw on a bow and arrow, it, there's a laser spirit. You become one with the path of your mystical flight of the arrow. And all the best shooters in the world and I'm not one of them, but all these masters, um, Rob Lethem, and I could name so many, when they come up, there's a samurai thing happening. That You watch how fast they can knock down steel plates. I'm lucky if I can shoot a gun into the ground that fast. <laughs> these guys yeah. are knocking down steel plates. <laughs> get, 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 get. And I go, I don't even know if I can pull the trigger that fast, much less hit something. Um, so training, I wouldn't put it as a mandatory because I don't mm -hmm. like anybody else mandating anybody else's responsibilities. But I'm yeah, as finding- As soon as we do that. 
<laughs> yeah, we get, finding, we get government intervention. They can mess it up. <laughs> I'm finding that the instinct, especially when it comes to a new gun owner, is to get familiar with that firearm. And I implore all my fellow USCCA members out there, all my fellow shooters out there, as we encourage people to get guns and carry that gun and have the capability and understanding and responsibility to, to neutralize evil, that's really what carrying a gun is about. When your life is threatened, you need to neutralize that threat. And that is best accomplished with range time, trigger time, training. So the more train, you can't get too much training. Uh, like I said, my grandsons are coming out here and we have, a, my, my dad's old uh, Remington Target Master single shot bolt action 22 with really fine uh, 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 iron sights, <laughs> yeah. aim small, miss small. And we, we use CV caps and some uh, uh, subsonic stuff, even though I still have, have eyes and ears on. But boy, they, they're putting the bullets in the same hole, they're only at 21 feet, but they're putting the bullets in the same hole off a bench. And that's, they love that. They love their soccer. They love their basketball. They love their football. They, they love their archery. But you can hardly get those guns out of those kids' hands because they're learning that sight acquisition, the breathing, the trigger control, where that trigger breaks, and they're competing by putting bullets in the same hole. And it's so gratifying to this old grandpa shooter um, that my grandkids are continuing that tradition of aim small, miss small, focus, and safe firearms handling. And that qualifies as training. They become one with that rifle, that pistol. I use a 22 or Smith 22 revolver with uh, subsonic ammo. So they learn that trigger squeeze, double action, single action, and I'm telling you, I think I think their school grades are better because they spend a lot of time at the range. I swear to God, that. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right on stuff like that, and it it, it brings us back to something that you said. You know that that uh, old lady in the in the store in New York. Um, that's why we get training because we are going to be investigated and prosecuted, and we want to make sure that everybody does the right thing and everybody in America has the right to the best possible legal defense out there. And, and that's what we're all about here at the USCCA is making sure folks get trained, making sure that they avoid danger if they can, but if they can't, they need to overcome it. And you're absolutely right. Um, stop that threat and then, and then you'll have to deal with the aftermath after. Um, folks, I was here with Ted Nugent. This was one of the highlights of my life. You know, uh, I met him when I was 29. Now I'm 54. You do the math. This has just been a great day for me, Ted. Thank you so very much for being here and helping us out with this. And, and, and thank you for all you do introducing folks to the shooting sports and hunting in the outdoors. Um, this is absolutely amazing. So again, um, just a wonderful day for me. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Kevin. I feel like we got a little electronic campfire here going. A big salute to everybody at USCCA. I really believe that all gun owners should carry their gun. I believe that a responsible, free American should never be unarmed and helpless. Because if you're unarmed and helpless, you're unarmed and helpless. And if you have a date with your children, if you have a date with your family, and we have engineered recidivism in this country. Believe me, that's a term I came up with, but it's undeniable. We have engineered recidivism. We will walk the street with released evil, violent criminals. It's, it's guaranteed because of our failed court system and the corruption in the whole justice system, the so-called justice system. So unarmed and helpless is unarmed and helpless and a grossly irresponsible choice. So not only should you be familiar with the tools in your life, primarily a firearm to defend that precious gift of life, but you should be a member of the gun organizations, your state organization, Gun Owners of America, Second Amendment Foundation, the National Rifle Association. And now more than ever, as we see the unleashing of the worst violent criminals onto our streets intentionally, you should be, Everybody in your life should be a member of USCCA because you, in the most perfect, clean, self-defense shooting scenario, you will still be ravaged by our so-called justice system. 
in many instances it's it's proper in many instances it's improper so be sure i think the greatest christmas gift the greatest anniversary gift the greatest birthday gift the greatest gift is a membership in uscca and you should encourage everybody in your life just being gun guys ourselves isn't good enough we need to spread that wisdom and that self-evident truth that self-defense is the ultimate responsibility of a of a human being and being a member of uscca is more imperative and more critical today than ever. So I hope that people are spreading that word and giving away those memberships or at least encouraging people to sign up. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Ted. And, and folks, remember, uscacacom slash Nugent, the uh, seven justifications for the use of deadly force. You can get it there absolutely free. Thank you for everything, Ted. You stay safe out there. Have a great time. Yep. God bless America. God bless my fellow uh, hunters out there. I hope everybody has a great season and let's make this country great again. ASAP. Thank you, Kevin.